should we start? Should we kick off? Go ahead. Yeah? Okay. So, welcome everyone to this consciousness uh, talk. Uh, this is session number 11. It's pretty cool. So, uh, we have uh, two speakers uh, joining us today, Matteo Grasso and Steven Phillips. And we are uh, very happy to have them here. So, um, the format for today's session is as usual half an hour per speaker. The uh, speaker will try to speak for maybe 15, 20 minutes and then uh, leave a short uh, Q&A uh, for that. And then uh, in the last of an hour or so, we will have an uh, open discussion, open debate. Okay, so if that's all right, I will introduce the first speaker. Uh, so we are very happy to have uh, Matteo Grasso here with us. He's a postdoc uh, in Giulio Tonio's lab, University of uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, originally a philosopher, as we have heard, but uh, then he turned into a neuroscientist, so that's pretty cool. Okay, so he's going to talk about uh, the scientific study of consciousness. Can we study conscious experience scientifically? Over to you, Matteo. Right, so thank you very much now, Ariel and Nicolo, for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm, I'm very happy to be talking in this uh, this venue, this online venue. Um, so I decided to uh, give a sort of more general talk because recently we've published two papers that I've been working on for three years now, and uh, I wanted to combine the main message of these two papers and add a little bit of of the work that is going to come to present basically to you the direction that IIT is taking in this um, this time. So the outline of my talk will be that I will briefly comment on the status of conscious science in the recent past and especially in the present to basically highlight what we in a paper uh, have called the fallacy of misplaced objectivity, meaning the approach to the study of consciousness that uh, consciousness science, in particular neuroscience of consciousness, have been mostly taken. And then I will um, uh, sketch a, a proposal of how to uh, basically avoid this fallacy of misplaced objectivity and how to study uh, the subjective side of experience uh, scientifically. And in particular, I will focus on the case of visual experience um, and the experience of the extendedness of, of visual space. So first of all, um, very briefly, something about the history of the study of consciousness in science. Um, so in the 20th century, uh, we can see that the focus on uh, on um, on consciousness science has been uh, really characterized and the behaviors, the cognitive functions, uh, and the neural correlates of consciousness. Um, because we have been developing the tools that allowed us to study consciousness scientifically on these respects. And I will briefly comment on each of these three. Um, so, approaches. first of all, the uh, behavioral one, well, we know, all of us, I, I think, know very well that from the beginning of the study of psychology, uh, behaviorism was really trying to focus on the objectively observable features of the mind, which are stimuli and responsing. And responses and it was treating uh, everything in between as a black box and that was really the the sort of paradigm of, of behaviorism um everything else was considered sort of outside of the scope of an objective explanation and in contemporary neurology this is still very important the behavioral and stimulus responses are used to assess the presence or absence of consciousness so for instance when we uh, consider um, coma patients and vegetative state patients um, and there is also a dissociation uh, between uh, the be oh, sorry there is also evidence of a dissociation between the behavioral responses and consciousness we know for instance that some patients um, who have been diagnosed as in vegetative state were actually conscious and were able to answer questions like in the tennis experiment by Owen and colleagues. And we also know that uh, consciousness can, um, so behaviors can uh, happen in the absence of consciousness, such as in unconscious eye tracking. Um, so behavior is a very important tool to study consciousness because we have to start from behavior in order to uh, basically understand uh, phenomenology and use introspection, but we cannot stop uh, there. Um, of course, the science of consciousness moved to, to the study of functional correlates of consciousness, um, interpreting not only inputs and outputs, but also internal states and operations and cognitive functions such as attention, working memory, 
and executive functions uh, to study everything that a company's experience. And in a certain sense, functional correlates have been very important uh, because what is cognitively accessible and reportable is indeed uh, the main object of uh, the scientific objective um, explanation of, of consciousness. And this has given also rise to the distinction between access and phenomenal consciousness. Um, even more recently, uh, we have seen um, in the 20th century uh, the development of uh, a paradigm more in the neuroscientific side of, of science, uh, where we started looking for the neural correlates of consciousness in particular with the research program in initiated by Crick and, and Koch. And the idea here is that for the full NCC, we can search for the minimal neuronal mechanism that are jointly sufficient for any one experience. And we can also search for the content specific NCC, which means the neural mechanisms that specify a particular phenomenal content, such as a color, a face, a sound. And the methods are, of course, um, very uh, important and very useful, and they are impeccable from the point of view of uh, scientific standards. We can use uh, recordings of brain activity, we can use stimulation and lesion data. But in some cases, it was already clear in the paradigm of the neural correlates of consciousness that um, what we can study when we study neural correlates of consciousness is not experience per se. Uh, in this sentence that is just a quotation from K Crick and Koch, it, I think it's very evident they said, we can study how the experience of redness of red um, could arise from the actions of the brain, but uh, this is not really uh, giving us the full explanation. In, the hope is that um, the uh, study of the NCC in causal terms will make the problem of qualia clearer. It will not solve it per se. Uh, it's just impossible to uh, basically face it head on. We have to find a sort of indirect way. And uh, it is interesting that uh, in contemporary science, there is still this uh, spirit of uh, functionalism and uh, um, the idea that an objective science of consciousness should focus only on objective uh, um, functions or properties that uh, correlate with consciousness. And I think this quotation by Cohen Bennett is particularly clear where they said, we argue that all theories of consciousness that are not based on functions and access are not scientific. And they said a true scientific theory will say our functions such as attention, working memory, etc., come together to form a conscious experience. The idea is that for some strands of contemporary, let's say functionalism or even eliminativism or illusionism, only the functions matter since they can be studied objectively by independent observers. And of course, this is in line with the Galilean view of primary and secondary qualities. Anything beyond uh, these functions is either in existence for illuminativists or illusory for illusionists, or it's simply unscientific, like uh, partially also um, mentioned uh, in a, the unfolding argument paper that was recently published. And one of the cases that is always uh, often mentioned is the case of uh, the richness of experience. Um, people report to have a uh, rich experience, but if we consider what they can actually uh, access and report of these experiences, very limited. So in these cases, the idea is that only the output, the functional output and the, the report, the report of the um, the outcome of the access is what we can and should study scientifically. So this is sort of the uh, contemporary situation. Of course, there are some other paradigms, but this is definitely a leading trend. Um, in a recent paper uh, titled Conscious and the Fallacy of Misplaced Objectivity by Nia, Andren, myself, and other people from the lab, we have argued that stopping to the study of objective um, uh, functions is really committing a fallacy that we name misplaced objectivity, which means basically assuming that science provides objective explanation of objective phenomena and that therefore scientific theories of consciousness cannot and should not account for the subjective aspects of experience, but they should only focus on the objective properties that accompany them, such as function, because otherwise this would really be outside of the, of the realm of science. Um, now, we believe that a science of consciousness can be uh, uh, achieved, <laughs> and uh, this is why, uh, well, spoiler alert, but the answer to the title of my presentation is yes, we can study uh, consciousness, conscious experience scientifically in all its respects, not only the objective uh, sides, but also the subjective properties. And um, 
here's a little recipe to do that. Uh, the idea to avoid the fallacy of misplaced objectivity and also to avoid missing out on what is really important about consciousness is the following. It's first of all, we should revert the epistemic order. We should remember that the validity of access and report is really grounded in experience, not the other way around. So the functions are a good guide to consciousness and also report is a good guide to consciousness because we know that we are conscious when we perform them. If we were, if we didn't know that by uttering um, uh, sounds such as ouch, uh, we were basically trying to communicate pain, we wouldn't interpret this sound as correlated to pain, right? So um, I think this is important because most of the time this gets uh, a little uh, misunderstood. And the second point is that we should be careful about uh, what exactly are the uh, epistemic standards of explanation in science. It is true that in science we should have objective explanations, uh, which means really we should study a phenomenon in objective terms that are uh, you know, measurable and uh, the measures can be replicated, they have to be intersubjective, etc. However, this doesn't mean that in the specific case of consciousness we should also um, assume that the explanandum of our theory should be objective because consciousness is basically uh, intrinsically subjective. If we were to substitute, to replace experience with functions just because they are objective, then we would end up explaining these functions and not experience per se. So the idea is that the explanation should be objective. Um, we should have an explanation in terms of objective properties of the neural substrate of consciousness that are measurable through the tools of, and methods of neuroscience. But the phenomenon to be explained should still be, meaning the explanandum should still be subjective. We should account for the subjective phenomenal properties of conscious experience that we can uh, basically get from introspection and uh, from uh, the report of phenomenology, the subjective report, and not the functions that accompany it. At most, we can use functions as the explanations, but definitely not. We shouldn't stop there. The idea of IIT in particular is that uh, to study consciousness, we should start with phenomenology, but also end with phenomenology. We should go back to phenomenology. Now, how do we do that? <laughs> and uh, in practice, what could be one way to show exactly how to do that? Well, uh, I'm uh, going to propose a, a very simple uh, experiment, which is a little simulation, to just give you the gist, the conceptual uh, um, sort of a picture of how this uh, explanatory uh, paradigm can work. In particular, I'm going to focus on the case of visual experience. And uh, now I'm going to do a little experiment here in front of your eyes, which is imagine you are a subject uh, looking at a, at, a, at a dark screen and uh, you're just fixating in the middle of the dark screen. Then you see a bright dot appearing to the right uh, of your fixation point you move your eyes and you basically fixate uh, your eyes on the bright dot um, and uh, you effectively just have uh, yeah, performed the function of fixation. So now the bright dot is in the center of your visual field. So when we describe the function of fixation, this is all we need to say. Um, but the experience that you're having while this function is being performed is, of course, much more complex. In particular, um, the fact that you're even seeing in the first place an extended black canvas in front of your eyes is not something that we should take for granted because if I were to ask you a lot of questions about how, how big it is, uh, what shape, uh, what shade of black or gray, you would have a lot of things to say. And um, an explanation of the experience of, uh, for instance, just a dark screen would have to account for all these properties because these are subjective properties that you are experiencing. So in particular, um, one of the ideas is that in order to experience something extended like the 2D space of visual experience, you would have to, well, first of all, experience a lot of different locations just to be able to experience the location of a, of a bright dot appearing and then moving your eyes and fixating it so that it is at a different location. You will have to basically have in front of your eyes or be able to uh, focus your attention on a lot of different locations. And of course, all these locations would need uh, to relate in very specific ways to be ordered spatially in the way that you would, um, that you would uh, describe if triggered. So you would say, the bright dot was to the right and now it's at the center and it is 
this far from, for instance, the last margin or this far from the top margin. So there are a lot of relations between all the possible locations in your visual field that are um, part of your experience. And interestingly, um, all these subjective properties are really the ones that we have to explain when we want to explain something like uh, the experience of fixating a point, uh, fixating a bright dot. Um, and this is relevant uh, because uh, we know that in the brain there are different systems that perform the same functions, for instance, in this case, fixation, in different ways. There are some subcortical systems, like the one that you see here, in mostly gray, that um, goes from uh, the retina to the thalamus, and then basically uh, triggers a movement of the eye muscles. Um, and then we have some uh, cortical uh, pathways that instead um, involve uh, occipital cortex, parietal cortex, the frontal eye fields, and both these, um, these systems we know can perform something like fixation, but we also know that in some cases this fixation, this fixation function is accompanied by experience, and in some other cases, like we suspect the subcortical pathways, um, they are not accompanied by uh, the experience of, of extended visual space, etc. So the fact that these two systems, and this is just a very simple example of any two systems that perform the same function, um, the fact that these two systems are functionally very similar but phenomenally very different is a hint that stopping at functions is not actually giving us the full picture. So in the paper that I am uh, going to present you now, which is a very, very, as I said, simple example of exactly this, um, we uh, tried to push the, the line of argument by building two simple systems um, that perform exactly this. Then there is a sort of artificial eye uh, that is able to, if uh, shown a, a, a bright dot in its visual field, it's able to basically track it uh, by activating the muscles. And this eye has a retina. If you see the A, B, C, D, F, G uh, uh, lowercase um, units, and then it has a uh, basically visual cortex, which is the capital A, B, C, D, F, G, and then you have four uh, muscle units which move uh, the eye, rotate the eye. So when uh, one of the retinal units is activated, uh, one of the uh, visual cortex units is activated so that the eye moves. And this artificial system, which is a fixation system, can be actually implemented in two different ways. One, having what we call a grid as the visual cortex, which is a set of units that are um, laterally connected and also receive inputs from the retina. In this case, the retina is at the top and they output to the muscle units, which are uh, at the bottom. But this system can also be implemented uh, with a map in the as visual cortex, in which case there are no lateral connections between these units, but they still receive inputs and uh, have outputs. Um, in the same way. And you can see the activation function of different units, uh, but also you can find all the details in the paper that, that has just came out. So the idea here is that these two systems are really as similar as you can get. They are very, very, they're basically behavioral, uh, behaviorally equivalent. Uh, here I'm just showing uh, the median of uh, basically the response um, when you show a bright uh, dot in, uh, in, the, in the beam A, in location A, and you can see how the trajectory of uh, the system uh, moving and then fixating over, um, over the bright dot, meaning moving the stimulus onto the center unit D uh, happens. And in this case, the two medians of the grid system, the, the grid system and the map system are the same, or at least, yeah, very, very similar. Um, so we can say these two systems are uh, behaviorally equivalent, uh, but this is not the only thing we can say about these two systems. In fact, um, we can also uh, correlate the uh, state of the uh, internal units, meaning the, the visual cortex, um, with the state of the uh, retinal units. And we can basically show that these systems have uh, retinotopy. So in exactly the same case, when we perturb each of the individual um, inputs, um, we show that in the uh, in both the grid and the map, the response is the same between the two systems. And this allows us to both do some sort of uh, analysis that we often do in neuroscience, where we consider the encoding and decoding uh, properties of this system. We can, we can say that this system encodes some representations about 
the state of the world and the state, of course, of its input array. And we can also decode um, the state um, of the world based on the state of the visual cortex. So representationally and behaviorally, these systems are equivalent. And even more importantly, if we just describe the input output function of these systems, ignoring what's actually going on in, in the layer in the middle, um, they are again uh, incredibly similar. We have basically the same uh, probabilities for um, the, the same state of activation of the inputs and uh, the uh, state of activation of the motors. And we can also study this system based on tuning functions and show that this system has five tuning functions that are selective for states of the, of the inputs. So this is all just uh, very quick, but uh, again, you can find more details in the paper, but this is just to show that we can have different systems. Systems are dramatically different in their internal setup. And here, the difference is also not as dramatic as it can be in the brain, um, but that are behaviorally represent representationally and functionally equivalent. So the question is now, is this enough to account for conscious experience? Well, if we were to consider the um, explanandum of a theory of consciousness, the functions that accompany experience, then we would say, well, yes, we have said basically everything there is to say uh, about these two systems. However, as we claimed before, uh, we also know that um, there are subjective properties that accompany these functions. And these subjective properties are the ones that we have to explain. And so far, by talking about behavior, representation and functions, input output functions, we haven't really touched upon these uh, subjective properties that I have introduced when I showed you uh, the first uh, bright dot. So the idea of IIT is that uh, we can explain Hi objectively the, the subjective. And to do uh, so... Sorry, Matteo, have... can, yep. can I interrupt you? Uh, of course. We, have, uh, we have 25 minutes in, so if you want to perhaps leave a five minutes for questions, you can... Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. yes. I will Thank just you. say very briefly that the idea of IIT is that we have to find a property. Uh, can I can I conclude in one minute? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, the idea of IIT is that we can study uh, some objective physical properties of these systems and uh, basically retrieve the difference that allows us to explain why in some cases phenomenology is there and in some other cases subjective properties are not there. And in IIT, this uh, amounts to unfolding the cause-effect structure of these systems. And in this case, I can just show briefly that if we were to perturb and observe and compute all the uh, uh, causal powers of these two systems, by virtue of having a grid rather than a map, we would get dramatically different cause-effect structures. And more importantly, we could show that at the top, you can see a very minimal cause of structure, which is not even a, a single cause of structure, but seven separate cause of structures for the map. And at the bottom, you can see the cause of structure of the grid. And you can see that the location of each individual um, point in the visual field of this little artificial eye is actually defined intrinsically in the case of the grid, but not in the case of the map. And the idea here is that the spatial properties of uh, distance and uh, relative locations that we described before that characterize our experience are there for the grid, but not for the map. So the idea of IIT in general is that there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between objective physical properties of the substrate of consciousness and every subjective property that we report about phenomenology. And this shouldn't just be for the extendedness of space in this case, but it should also be for other things like the fact that we are able to explain to explain in physical terms the perception of the flow of time or the fact that we see faces and they are <laughs> objects uh, that are bound, they are, um, uh, they are uh, uh, examples of a, of a more abstract concept that we have and that has been studied in neuroscience for a long time, that we perceive colors, we perceive pain, and we perceive all others. Uh, qualia that philosophers have, have been talking about. So the idea of this correspondence has to be an objective explanation, but of these subjective properties, not just the functions that accompany them. Um, so quick conclusion, we must uh, explain uh, subjective experience scientifically. The explanation should be objective, yes, but the explanandum should still be subjective. Otherwise, we are missing out on what we should explain 
And the idea of IIT is basically to sketch a proposal like the one that I uh, mentioned and establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between a cause effect structure and a phenomenal structure. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Great talk. Um, so we have a couple of, quest uh, couple of minutes for questions. Um, so feel free to raise your hand. Yeah, are you? We can't uh, hear you. Maybe it's just me. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so great talk, Matteo. I'm sure you get this question all the time, but I imagine many functionalists would say they absolutely agree with you that they're trying to explain uh, the subjective aspects of experience and that uh, we need to uh, have explanations that touch on objective measures. Um, I suspect what they would be taking issue with is the fact that the two examples you provided are both from a system that can't provide subjective reports in any way. It just like does fixation and it, it can't say what it's doing or report anything. Um, and their comment would be that we should be agnostic on the phenomenal properties of such systems and that like the consciousness doesn't come in until there's like a system that's actually capable of providing reports on that in some way. And that to talk about consciousness in a system that can't provide reports is super suspect anyway. Like ultimately, uh, we rely on the reports. So is there is there a clear or quick uh, counter to that sort of point or is do you just have to get into the philosophy in detail oh no no i can try <laughs> of course it's a very long story and it's an excellent question it's a crucial central question so um well so i do agree that these systems i i wouldn't bet my money that they are conscious that they experience space <laughs> surely they're not gonna tell us and that's why of course these are just simulation just examples but they uh, try to prove the point that um, we can compute in simple systems intrinsic causal powers that go beyond uh, functions where functions are, are basically equivalent but on your general uh, claim um, or question about uh, the um, basically necessary role of report i 100 percent agree that we do start from report that's exactly what i i tried to convey we have to rely on functions and access and behavior to validate our theory of consciousness because without uh, you know experience in the first place and the ability to communicate that we're having an experience then we wouldn't we would basically miss the starting point however limiting our explanatory and also in a sense, predictive capacities to the presence of report, that to me is a limiting factor that I'm not entirely sure it's even uh, necessarily reasonable. And the reason why I say it's, it's not necessarily reasonable is that exactly like we know that report is a good uh, sign for consciousness, so it's, it's, it's basically the tool we use to um, access uh, experience in the first place, we also have evidence um, that in some cases there is delayed report, like in dreaming, there are cases in which people can uh, can basically uh, report uh, that they have had an experience uh, in a way that is completely uh, independent from what we were looking for. So I think the evidence that we can have experiences without report um, should make us uh, consider that there are situations, especially, for instance, at the bedside of the patient, when we have non-communicative, you know, patients uh, that we might as well just consider veget in vegetative state, um, in which we have to be very careful about our uh, interpretation of report. It's not always more conservative to say, if there is no report, I'm just assuming that there is no consciousness. So in this case, we could say some artificial systems might not report that they are having an experience. The question whether they're conscious or not is still open. So now, this is just to methodologically address the issue of how to use report. Uh, on the other hand, the fact that report is necessary just to, or let's say some form of capacity, at least in principle, of reporting your experience is necessary for consciousness, well, that's a separate issue. And I think we should have to demonstrate that every time you're having an experience, there is some mechanisms that are uh, basically um, allowing us to report it at least to ourselves. And this is something that, I mean, I can't talk about this now, but I think it is, uh, it is an open question, and especially in the global workspace uh, paradigm, um, this is a key feature, the self-reportability. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's a separate issue. So. Great, so Marco? Hi there. And uh, Ciao Matteo, I'm oh. really, sorry, 
can people hear me by the way yes everything fine cool um good to see you again i'm glad to, i got to catch your talk a second time because i think it's important and that's uh, for, for that to be required um so, so i have a bit of a two-part question and it relates to the previous question um so so first of all um maybe i'm misunderstanding the the, the, the debate that's going to help disappear but it feels to me that there is not really a need for that to, to be actually a conflict between functionalism and what you're presenting because it sounds to me that what it's more about is to expand a notion of functionalism. So implicitly, and I think, well, funny coincidence, and uh, now was there when I when we asked this question to uh, to a philosopher. Anyways, um, so in a way, we can argue that phenomenology has evolutionary basis. So far, it, it evolved and might have some function attached to it. And given that you also kind of touched upon the fact that um, the difference between the maps and grids is that for one, for the grids, there's an intrinsic notion of the representation, right? So in a way, we could say that the phenomenology indicates reflexive or self-referential or intrinsic representations of the functional mechanisms, where the fact that it has the phenomenological significance indicates that the system has self-referentially um, uh, represented or acknowledged, in a way, um, the functional significance. So maybe uh, one kind of academical way to get past this debate is simply say, um, the objective science of subjectivity is to acknowledge the relation between functional, the functional relevance of these neurocognitive mechanisms um, and phenomenology. So in other words, dimensions or quality structures or space in which a particular phenomenology is defined in terms of indicates exactly the functional significance uh, uh, that, that the system has uh, indicated. Um, so uh, that is one part and a small uh, addendum is basically um, when you say what physical structures correspond to the or causal structures correspond to the phenomenological structure. Um, I think I think it's also interesting to ask about which motifs or which tropes or which patterns of structure um, can be associated with certain phenomenological qualities or experiences. For example, what I find interesting is the notion of abstraction, curiosity what makes something interesting. I think these could be associated with a certain um, structural motif. For example, in there is a paper where literal um, network depth with respect to the seed um, loci, so primary sensory areas, um, has a very strong relation with participants' subjective reports and how abstract uh, uh, the notion, idea, or task was. And so in other words, that would be an indication of basically if you take a system that is whole brain, secluded from the world, um, then basically that network depth is a structural property or a structural motif. Um, and that's interestingly could be seen as uh, being associated with, with the phenomenology of abstraction by virtue of the fact that the system would, given the previous claim, uh, model in some parsimonious way uh, abstraction or the degree of depth or distribution of the activation corresponding to the task. Anyways, um, I'm not sure what I was going for, but uh, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> yes, thank you for the question. Very interesting. And I'm afraid I can't uh, uh, say as much as I would like to, but let me try to super briefly to answer both points. So the first point about functionalism, I have two uh, comments. The first one is that in this paper in particular, and definitely in this talk, we are referring to a specific flavor of functionalism, which is, let's say, input-output functionalism, meaning this fun type of functionalism that is really the most extreme you can get, which is that if two systems are functional equivalent in the sense that you black box everything about their structure, they can be as different as you want. One can be the unfolded version of the other. One can have a thousand more neurons. It doesn't matter. If their input and output layers are the same and the state transitions are the same, then they have to be the same. Otherwise, you are basically appealing to properties that are unscientific or outside the realm of science. So I think uh, this is the, 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 the sort of uh, the, the, the critical target of our, of our paper. I don't think any type of functionalism has to commit the fallacy of misplaced objectivity. And also because I do believe that we have to use functions in a sense to describe the physical powers of, of our system. So now the second comment on your first question is that it really depends what we mean by function. <laughs> I am, uh, I've, I've spoken in the past with uh, people that are uh, devoted functionalists, or at least they, they, they uh, sympathize like uh, Francis Fallon, who um, uh, 
uh, basically believe that you can give a, a functionist rendition of IIT. And I just think at that point it becomes maybe it's most of a terminological issue. It depends what you mean by function. If a cause effect structure is a function because it's a causal, um, basically, uh, visually <laughs> function in the mathematical sense, so then maybe this can be an interpretation where IIT is more compatible with, with versions of functionism. The point is that um, if you define functions as objective, uh, you know, things, you have to go beyond it and really use them to study phenomenology. This remains uh, true even if you consider a notion of function that is closer to the IIT notion of, of a causal, basically uh, causal functionalism that have been proposed also in philosophy. So for the second question, a 30 uh, seconds uh, answer. Yes, this in the slide, if you can still see it, is where we're going. We are going to try to study what some people uh, use a fancy term uh, and call mm -hmm. modes of experience and modes of existence, which are space, time, concepts, color, pain, other qualities, emotions, thought. All these things are, as you say, like tropes or, or you can say maybe some specific uh, types, subtypes of experience. But of course, you can add to your list whatever you want. You can add creativity, you can add, uh, you know, insight. You can add a lot of things. and. Um, there is an interesting mathematical approach, which is the one to ask, what are the graph uh, theoretical um, uh, sort of uh, architectures that are going to ground these different contents of experience? And can they be sort of um, uh, 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 categorized separately? We, we, we think that grids, for instance, uh, are uh, contributing space to experience. Direct grids are probably responsible for time. Inverted trees or rooted trees are probably important for concepts. It's a cliques for colors. And maybe you can add to the list some other graph theoretical um, architectures to, in, in the end, explain all these different things like thought and creativity. But this is definitely an open question that is incredibly interesting. And maybe, I don't know, 100 years <laughs> we'll, we'll get to approach. But yeah, thanks for the questions. Thank you for the answers. Oh, good. Thank you. So let's uh, thank again, uh, um, Matteo. Thank you very much. I guess you can uh, you. move on to our second uh, speaker for today. So we're very happy to have Stephen Phillips uh, joining us. Um, he works. Uh, um, he works. Sorry, here at the is a chief uh, senior researcher at the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, Japan. As part of the Mathematical Nuclear Science Group and the Human Informatics and Interaction Research Institute. And we talked, uh, we talk about the data spaces category, shift theory, and the phenomenology. Uh, over to you, Stephen. Okay. It might have been that I had uh, the presentation software already open. Might have been caused the issue. Okay, so um, the key word here, I guess, is um, shift. Which I think is probably not familiar to most people. So what I want to do um, is just give an informal introduction to the, the notion of sheaf and, and the way that we do this to model some uh, cognitive tasks that I'll bring up uh, in the next slide. <coughs> so as uh, Matteo mentioned, uh, functionalism is sort of the standard pro approach to to doing to doing modelling in, in the sense that. Uh, we think of cognitive representations as processes as sort of functions between sets of cognitive states. <clears throat> I show in this uh, top panel here. Now, the sheaf theory approach is a little bit different, and it's similar, but a little bit different in the sense that <clears throat> what we're really doing is explicitly modelling the, 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 the space on which these uh, function, uh, these uh, cognitive states reside, and it's this extra dimension here. Uh, this explicit modeling of space that gives us some flexibility to uh, uh, talk about uh, the phenomena, phenomena that we are going to introduce next. So, so all I want you to think and get away from this slide here is that instead of just having a set of cues and a set of targets and say that some function that the subject is supposed to learn, we also have a notion of, the, of these cues and targets sitting on some uh, space and it's, it's a, what's called a topological space. And so the, 
The map is actually a map between uh, this arrow here, which represents the, the cues, and this arrow here, which represents the targets. And so being a function, it's called a morphism. And the reason for that is it's not just any map between cues and targets. It's, it's a map that preserves the structure, <clears throat> the structural relationship between the, the, the shape of the space uh, and the data that's sitting on that space. And in, in a way, what's called, uh, in a way that's in category theory is called uh, to be commutative. That means the map from here, from space to cues to targets, is the same as the map from space to targets. In other words, what a category theorist would say is that the morphism or the, the sheaf morphism preserves this structure. And so these areas are called sheaves, and these these um, diagonal areas are called sheaves, and these horizontal areas are called sheaf morphisms or maps between sheaves. And when you do that, you get a, a sort of a, a more general notion of um, a more general model in which there are sort of two dimensions of, of mappings. So we have these maps between the data, so we fix the space X, and the data on, on X get mapped from one set to another set. That's these horizontal maps. And we also have a, a map between, we can also map between the space, so we have data map, we have the representations as data on a space X, and then being transformed onto another space Y. So that's the sort of general uh, idea behind the sheath theory approach. So the key word here is that representations are not in a space, but uh, they sit on a space. The space is being explicitly modeled. So to make this a bit more concrete, let's uh, use, do a, a, an example, something that would be more familiar to uh, psychologists, is, a, is, a, um, uh, is this uh, learning and induction task. So in the left panel, in the top left panel here, <coughs> this is uh, this is just a sort of standard uh, Q target learning task where, where what you what the subjects uh, have to learn is a map from a pair of letters uh, to coloured shapes. <coughs> now the point about this task is there are two ways of doing it indicated by these two uh, two bunch of lines. <coughs> you can either map this directly in the sense that. You can regard the two letters as sort of uh, just a, a unique Q <clears throat> and map them directly to this uh, uh, coloured shape. Or you can observe that the <clears throat> each letter can be decomposed, or this map can be decomposed into two maps. One is a map from a letter to the shape, this chart of shape here, or and a map to a letter from a letter to a colour, and it's. So the actual map itself is a product of these two maps. <clears throat> and so there are two ways of interpreting uh, this particular task. And it's this, this dual interpretation that we want to exploit in, in this uh, um, experiment. <clears throat> and what we did was um, construct it in a way such that <clears throat> each subject learned a, a mapping uh, of uh, cues to targets such that the number of mappings uh, increased. So in the in this middle panel here, what we have is the number of unique characters and the number of unique shapes and uh, colors that gets manipulated or, or increases with it uh, as a measure, as a manipulation of the difficulty of the, of the learning task. So, for example, in a, in a simple case, with there are only three unique letters, <clears throat> three unique shapes and three unique uh, uh, colors. And so, that, since it's a product of these, uh, there are nine possible maps. And then, and we, we, after they left that task and we uh, test them on their performance, we uh, increase the number of uh, letters and, and colours and so forth, and the task becomes increasingly difficult. And so all, 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 they're, all they're required to do, is, as shown in this top right-hand panel, is given a pair of letters, um, predict what is the uh, coloured shape that's associated with that. And uh, during the training phase, we give them feedback. So it's a, it's a forced two-choice response task in that... <clears throat> For example, given PK and uh, red triangle, they're supposed to determine or learn, uh, is that the correct associate for that, that Q? And then we give them feedback during the training. Now, if they've, now the, the point here is that if they've learnt the product structure, then they should be able to make predictions on novel uh, letter pairs. That's because if, you, if you've, in the training set, if you've learnt that uh, G maps to star and, let's say, uh, K maps to uh, uh, green. Uh, then, when you if, when you see G combined with another letter, you can make the prediction 
uh, even without having seen it before. This is sort of a standard test of generalization that you would see in, say, the neural network learning uh, literature and so forth. So the way to do this, of course, is to split the original um, set of <coughs> Q target maps into uh, a training set and a testing set so that they're given uh, they're, they're, they're given training on the cues on <coughs> and targets, about 50% of the cues and the possible cues and targets. Uh, to, and from there, we give, uh, after they've learned the training set, then they give them uh, the novel pairs to see if they indeed can predict it. Now, if they've learned the, if they've understood and learned the um, uh, product structure of the task, then they should be able to predict um, the target for a given novel Q pair. So this is what the, and, and the data on the, the lower right panel uh, is, uh, illustrates this point. So what I want to focus on today is just the, the data on the circle by the red ellipse. So what we see as <clears throat> what the graph shows is on the x-axis the, the particular task. So three means that it was a, it was a, it was a three by three, I had nine mapping task. Four means it was a four by four, uh, five by five and six by six. So. <clears throat> Uh, as the as the number of characters increases, the, the number of mappings that they have to learn also increases. And the uh, vertical axis just represent, represents the, just shows the uh, the error rate how how accurate they were on both the old that is the training set and also the novel testing set. And so because there are, there's only two possible uh, responses, then chance level of response is fifty percent. So what we see here, for example, in, in this group here, the group of subjects here that the response rate for the three by three case, the smallest um, mapping task was at chance level. So they didn't learn the, they didn't induce the product structure. But as, a, as the task became increasingly difficult, uh, then they started to uh, um, infer the structure as indicated by their uh, above chance performance on the testing set of uh, cues. And what we have here, there, the motivation for this task actually, and in fact, my work in general is not specifically about consciousness. This is for a more of a cognitive psychology type, cognitive science type task. We're interested in this sort of like structure that people use to, um, uh, when they learn. However, <clears throat> um, what we see and, and what this task, what these, the two circles show that we had two groups of subjects. One, one group learned the task in ascending order of difficulty and other learned the task in descending order of difficulty. And it's, it's the ascending group that um, of interest today. And we see as the task gets more and more difficult, they, they switch from uh, this chance level performance to this above chance level performance. And that's indicative. If you look at the endpoints of this, that's indicative of the two different styles, of two different ways of representing the task. The direct map here, the associative map, <coughs> would give you uh, no, um, would afford no uh, generalization on the novel pairs because you would, because what's, what, what that is saying is that they're treating each of the pairs of letters as a unique uh, Q, having no similarity to, to any other, having no compositional structure or constituent structure, which we think can exploit to make the uh, novel predictions. Whereas if they learn it by the product, as a product of two maps, I uh, go around this direction here, then uh, it affords uh, prediction on the novel uh, Qs. And that's what this, uh, change in performance indicates, we're supposed to indicate. Now, <clears throat> how this relates to um, uh, consciousness or phenomenology, uh, as I said, the, the, the task was really, really set up for something else, but what we did after, at the end of each experiment, we asked the subjects to self-report on, on anything that, that they felt was important about what they did during the, their experience of, of, of doing the learning task. And what we found is that uh, not all um, not all subjects, only about half, uh, of the 30 or so uh, participants that we tested, about 20 of them were aware at some point uh, that the <coughs> the task had an underlying uh, structure. Uh, that is that they realised that the one of the letters mapped to colour and the other letter mapped to uh, a shape. However, <coughs> 10 subjects did, were, were not aware of this. And this difference is, and so what we did is reanalyze the data into, uh, using the aware unaware uh, report as the uh, as a, uh, as a factor, and we see that the for the aware group their performance their improvement in uh, predictability of the targets 
uh, was the same as in the previous report. I, uh, there was this transition between associative and relational um, learning or understanding of the task. Whereas in the other, other in the other way group, there was no perform, there was no uh, improvement in uh, predictivity of the uh, targets. In other words, their performance on the novel on the test patterns was a chance level across all set sizes. And so, um, the aware being aware of the underlying structure was crucial to um, being able to predict the uh, um, targets for the novel uh, letter pairs. Now, now, so what I want to show you now is how this uh, specific uh, task can be modelled uh, in, in what's called sheaf theory terms, in terms of sheaves. <clears throat> and the way to do that is to, and, and the way this is done, is to <clears throat> treat the uh, the cues and the targets as as the, the stimuli as data attached to this underlying topological space. Now, <clears throat> the, the sheet theory itself is, is quite technical, but uh, one way to think about this, conceptualise this, is, is uh, in terms of uh, relational databases. So you can think of the the space. In, in this particular case, it, it's a space. It's what's called a topological space. Um, so there's some notion of um, uh, closeness between points in the space, but no notion of uh, a distance. So it's a weaker notion of space than what we what you're probably more familiar with in, say, uh, a metric space or a vector space or something like that. And so in this particular case, uh, because the, there are two letters and there is a colour and a shape dimension, uh, we, can, we can treat the uh, space as a, as a two-point topological space that uh, each point corresponds to a dimension, uh, uh, a uh, feature dimension. And on top of that we, is the value of that particular feature. So, for example, if, if you were to see the um, GK letter pair, then represented as a as a sheaf would be <coughs> to, would be, is analogous to say treating this as, as like a, a table of data where the the space itself, the first and second dimensions, is uh, corresponds to the header of the table. And then the data uh, are the rows of that table. So, <clears throat> in this particular task, uh, in the in this particular condition, there are four possible cues. There are four training cues that get mapped to four colour shapes. And so, what this would look like is a table of letter pairs that gets mapped to another table of letter pairs. So, the first table on the, on the top right hand side is the table for cues, <clears throat> uh, represent the cue stimuli. Uh, the second table at the bottom is the targets representing the colored shapes, and it's just a mapping from the, the top table to the bottom table. Now, the key point here, uh, and it's not just any mapping, it, it, as I mentioned in the very first slide, it, it, it's a mapping that must preserve some sort of structure. And the structure in this case is a relationship between the underlying space, the topological space, and the data that sit on this table. Now, <clears throat> there's a technical way of doing this, but uh, intuitively, if you think, this relationship is maintained by having the the, the data on the associated column uh, on the associated point uh, sit or represented by the same uh, in terms of the same column of data. So the the cues are the rows and the positions are aligned by the columns of the table. And this is a, this is sort of a straightforward way of, of thinking about uh, sheaves. Although the concept of sheaves is much more general, and this is just a special case, but it it's convenient for uh, giving an intuition as to what's going on. And so the <clears throat> there are some extra columns here. I think I'll just uh, I'll talk about the reason. Well, the reason for the, the extra columns is that to be a topological space, I mean, uh, topological spaces are, well, actually, no, well, I'll, I'll leave that. I'll come back to that later. But anyhow, the main point here is, that, is, is to take away is that it's, you can think of this as a table of, of cues, a table of targets, and there's a map between these two tables that preserves this uh, um, the, the spatial structure. Okay, and so this map is called a, in this case, a, a morphism or pre-sheaf morphism. Now, how does the generalization aspect come come about, <clears throat> and why is it? So the, the thing the thing we want to go back to the original uh, thing, the thing we want to uh, address 
is this change in generalization performance here indicative of this change from learning the map as an association to learning the map as a relationship between or as a product relationship between uh, the, the, the cons constituent maps. So this point here and this point here. How that how, how that works uh, from a sheet theory perspective. <coughs> Let's have on the left hand slide. Uh, this deals with the uh, generalization case. How this works is that um, on the the left column uh, indicates the models the map that the subjects learn from training. So, for example, they would have, during training they would have seen the um, GK stimulus, and they would have been given feedback to say that that maps to the red triangle stimulus, and they would have been and they would have seen KP, and they would have seen that that maps to um, green club, and so forth. And <clears throat> now the the generalization is captured by this notion of, of sheeting or sheetification. Now, what that means is that <clears throat> Uh, because, and, and because of the uh, structure of the underlying space, we can <coughs> complete this map here um, by looking by, uh, it's, this is called a, um, a joint, oh, this is, how should I say, um, there is a, two, there, <coughs> the, the training set is represented by this pre-sheet and the sheeting operation takes the pre-sheaf and sets it to its near, nearest sheaf. And what the sheaf really is, is a sort of a completion of, of the table of information that's given in this pre-sheaf. And in this particular case, and because of the, the structure of the underlying topological space, <coughs> the pre-sheaf results in a, a larger table, which includes the old uh, maps and the new, the new combinations. In other words, it's, it's what in this particular case is really the product of the uh, of the two. It completes the product of the two uh, constituent maps. That is the map from uh, the first letter to the color, and the map from the second letter to the color, <coughs> and giving you the complete table. And hence, uh, the sheaving operation uh, corresponds to the prediction of what the uh, novel uh, letter pairs should map to in, term, in terms of their targets. <clears throat> and so this uh, this corresponds to the sort of relational or product understanding of the structure of this task. However, the, the, the point here is, now the point here is is that the the ability the the effect of sheaving also depends on the structure of the underlying space. So here the original space is, is a two point discrete topological space. However, if we just uh, model it as the underlying space is a single point, and we do the, we apply the sheeting process again. Uh, what happens in terms of in the, from the sheet theory perspective is that you get no generalization. Uh, the technical reason for that is because the the pre sheaf on the left hand side is already a sheaf. Okay, but the sort of psychological explanation here is the difference between uh, the left hand side and the right hand side is the difference between treating the uh, the letter pairs as as individual as a pair of individual letters versus treating the letter pairs as just a single chunk of pairs. Okay, and this is and this difference is expressed by the shape of the underlying topological space. So on the left hand side we have a two point topological space, on the right hand side we have a one point space, and the effect of sheaving uh, is significantly different in these two cases. So psychologically, you can think of this as a kind of chunking dechunking idea. Uh, sort of a formal, uh, formal notion or characterization of chunking. So, for example, take the letter, take the, the string of letters uh, CAT. You can interpret CAT in one of two ways: either as a single word, uh, sorry, either as a string of, of three letters CAT, or as an, an <coughs> or as a single word, which is cat. And what that, from a sheet theory perspective, what that means is if you <coughs> and, and you can change between the two of the. Uh, these two kinds of representations, or these these two interpretations, and this <clears throat> this is the other aspect that I mentioned in the beginning that um, is is that if we change the underlying space on which these data are attached, then we get a different effect on a different implication on in terms of a generalization, and this is called a uh, <clears throat> in sheet theory terms, it's called a change of base. In psychological terms, you can think of this as uh, like de-chunking or chunking. So 
In the deep chunking case, you're taking the single word and splitting it up into its component letters. In the chunking case, you're ta taking the component letters and going in the opposite direction, uh, <coughs> converting it into a, a single word. Now, from a, now from a shift theory perspective, this is called um, uh, these two maps uh, correspond to a change of base. So what's what's cha being changed here is the uh, is the the space in which these data sit. So in the top case, for example, in the dechunking case, what we're doing is splitting the the single point into two points A and B. And in the bottom case, we're going in the reverse direction. <clears throat> now, formally, what this means is that, and, and this is and, and this is what this uh, the right hand sh uh, side is showing is that. Uh, in, a, in, in topology, the maps between um, topological spaces are kind of called continuous functions. So every continuous function in between two topological spaces induces these two maps between their between the, the associated pre-sheaves or sheaves, you know, the data that's sitting on this. And it's this notion here that captures the difference between uh, the sort of the, uh, the associated the associative understanding of the map and the relational understanding that is the um, what, what, what what we call the holistic understanding of the stimuli versus the component uh, compositional understanding okay. and so if we, we go back to so in fact what we, what I've just described here is 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 these two different start these two different forms of map <clears throat> the sheaving is the the transformation of the data uh, from, uh, on, with the, um, the space hill constant and the, the change of base is the data hill constant, but the map, the space itself is being changed. And so, so finally, then, uh, what does this say about the? What, what, why do we get this? Um, uh, relationship so what what changes what, what changes well behaviorally I should say oops, what's changing uh, for the this particular group of subjects who learn the tasks in order of simple to more complex uh, again from uh, no generalization to generalization well from the machine theory perspective okay from behaviorally in terms of responses okay the as the task becomes more difficult, they, there is an improvement in their um, target prediction for novel cues. Now, phenomenologically, <coughs> from according to their self-reports, <coughs> only those subjects who eventually became aware of the underlying product structure of the of the task uh, exhibited this uh, uh, behavioural change. Those who were unaware were at chance level at, across all all um, task size for all all, all uh, con uh, task conditions. Now, from a sheet theory perspective, what's changing is the underlying topological space. Okay, going from this one point space to this two point space, which affords the generalization by the sheeting um, construction. Now, we can also ask then what, what is the connection between topology and awareness? Well, in the two point uh, topological space, for example, the, the, for the Compositionality to have meaning, there must be the, there must be alignment between the data and the space for the <coughs> for the notion of uh, composite uh, to have a coherent meaning. For, sorry, for the notion of compositionality to be coherent. What that what that alignment in, in database terms, what that alignment is, is is the data that <coughs> is enforced by this uh, by having the data that is associated with the one dimension uh, align by the same uh, via the uh, by putting placing in the same columns, so the, the, for example, the um, the first letter aligns with the first position, and the second letter aligns with the second position, and then that must correspond um, also to the alignment of the color and shape. So <coughs> uh, colors must be aligned in one dimension, and uh, shapes must be aligned in another. And these two things uh, cannot be it cannot be uh, must be done consistently. And so there's an alignment issue, and to and, and hence, uh, to make this alignment, the uh, subjects have to be, should be aware of the structure. In the one point case, there is no alignment because the space is, is, is essentially a trivial topological space. Uh, a one point space is, is called the trivial topology. All the data aligned to the same point. So there's no sense of alignment 
hence there is no sense of needing to be aware of the of the underlying uh, spatial structure of the sorry the underlying topological structure uh, of the task. Um, put another way, um, the sets and functions are trivially sheaves and sheaf morphisms. Uh, that, that's that's the sort of informal. Now <clears throat> I can stop there if you want, or I can give you another ex another example um, of this. We are uh, we are twenty five minutes in, so depending on whether uh, people have question or yeah, I, uh, I, okay. I have a question already. But um, yep. so if you want to uh, wrap up a uh, bit, then maybe we can probably go from there to this. Yeah, I, I, I can wrap up here, actually. The, the rest of the slide, the, 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 second, the next two slides are just another example in, in, uh, of, of the application of a sheaf, which is in visual search. Visual feature, feature binding itself can be regarded as a sheaf. <clears throat> and very quickly, uh, there are different kinds of topological spaces, even for even if the number of points points in the space is the same and this is this is a different top, uh, topological space where we have three dimensions uh, color shape and its location and the the I, I didn't explain any of the the, the formal aspects of, of sheet theory because it's, it's rather involved but the notion of a topological space and how it differs from say metric space is that we have a notion of closeness given by the uh, by placing the points in open sets so in this particular case, a location is an open set. And, it's, and the way that these open sets are organized is that color is, is close to location, shape is location, but close to location, but shape and color themselves are not. And this gives you a different kind of shape and hence a, a different um, uh, notion of, um, uh, of, of structure, of spatial structure, and hence it has a different implication for when you do this, the sheeting process. Uh, and the rest of this is just a uh, sort of exam, uh, more details about that. So, that. so if you want more details, maybe you can go to those slides. But for this stage, maybe it's easier if I just finish right there. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Steve. So we have some time for questions. Um, I see that uh, Marco had uh, some questions in the chat. I don't know if uh, he's still interested in uh, in clarifications or anything like that otherwise we have uh, now yeah um, maybe uh, my question will be relatively brief and also uh, directed to both of you uh, Matteo and also Steve so um, I guess that's probably a good start um, so Ma Matteo's uh, uh, talk involved um, conceptual uh, co uh, cause effect structure to sort of phenomenal uh, structure kind of mapping, but uh, IAT itself doesn't have a uh, kind of mathematical tools to characterize the phenomenology, so that uh, you know it's difficult to make uh, prediction about, for example, phenomenology from just observing conceptual structure, right? And uh, you mentioned something like you know graph theoretical kind of you know approach, but I thought that you know. Uh, Something like shift theory or category theory might be uh, more interesting, and uh, you know the prospect of uh, you guys uh, of uh, thinking about this direction is something I wanted to ask as a uh, one question. So you know, how, what kind of mathematical tools would be, you know, useful or promising to make a prediction from concept a causal effect structure to phenomenal, and then would the shift or category theory? Be promising that's one thing and then uh with respect to uh, uh steve's talk um while i was listening um your example of a sheaf or one one point topology case seems similar to what matthew was talking about as a map case where it's a non-conscious you know uh eye movement kind of machine then uh if that's the case then uh according to your uh you know uh simulation and experiment it would probably predict that the map structure wouldn't be able to generalize, uh, you know, from three items, uh, three by three kind of, you know, mapping to four by four mapping and so on. Uh, whereas the, if it's, you know, connected in laterally, uh, like maps, maybe it's possible to generalize. So, you know, I, I wanted to ask about these kind of ideas to you guys. <laughs> 
Um, but maybe I can start just since the first part of the question was uh, directed to me. Um, so yes, I totally agree that uh, it would be nice to have a more uh, precise and rigorous way to characterize phenomenology and phenomenal structures and even to represent them mathematically. I 100% agree. Um, so far, I think the attempt to it is just to describe phenomenology based on introspection and for space and time. Um, it appeals to basically the notions of, you know, like set theory and, and, and topology and maybe mirror topology for some specific uh, descriptions of phenomenology. But for other things, I agree with you that uh, we need some sort of more rigorous way uh, to do that. Um, Maybe I said something a little uh, misleading um, when I talked about graph theoretical terms for um, uh, the uh, the mapping of the cosmic structure onto specific modes of experience. So the idea is that this is still, uh, it's mostly the graph theoretical definition is actually not really with phenomenology, but involves the relationship between a cosmic structure and its physical substrate. So the idea is, if I take a physical substrate that graph theoretically can be described as a grid, it will unfold into a cause effect structure that will sort of give you a topological space. If I take a graph, you know, theoretical architecture that is maybe a rooted tree, like an inverted tree, it will give you something like a conceptual space. Uh, for a directed grid, it will give you something like a, 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 what, a cause effect structure that we associate with time. But then there is the next step of going from the cause effect structure to phenomenology to the structure of phenomenology that is still sort of missing, or at least it's there, there's no mathematical way to uh, describe phenomenology that is just the use of introspection, introspective report. So I totally agree with you on this in this uh, respect that that's needed. Um, on the map versus greed, I 100% agree, and I think it's actually very interesting. And this is also maybe I. I jump on the train for the question uh, to Stephen, which is, I do think that uh, this approach with shift theory is very interesting if applied to the ability to basically develop new concepts. And in IIT, my project, by the way, in particular, the one I've been working on for a while, is really trying to study uh, how uh, objects are perceived as uh, basically abstract uh, instance or instances of abstract concepts. So when I see a face, I see it not only as a specific set of particular features, but it, it is a face. And in this case, what Stephen was saying is that it's very interesting how uh, in some cases we can be uh, more able to generate and generalize new concepts and in other case, cases we cannot. In my uh, understanding of what IIT says so far, more than grids and maps, it would be crucial to have uh, pyramidal structures. Like, for instance, in the back of the of the brain, the idea is that we have a lot of grids and we have pyramids of grids on top of each other. We know that, for instance, um, there are there is convergent com convergent architecture that leads to areas such as uh, FFA or concept cells. The idea is that we have this sort of convergent architecture that leads to generalization and, and, and concepts. So, yeah, I would like to add my 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 question to the uh, to the list um, because I think it is a very interesting application. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, um, yes. Yeah, so the. In Matteo's uh, discussion of uh, grids versus maps, you can see that there are, the maps don't have any lateral connections. So you, you can think of that as uh, to, uh, presumably there should be some way to re uh, cast that as uh, two different topological spaces. And the <clears throat> the reason why you get the generalization in the sheaf theory case is that there has to be some sort of intersect. Uh, the, well, the topological space is, is how the, the the space itself is sort of composite. Oh, I, actually, I, maybe it would have been easier if I showed the exact uh, an example of what a topology is, in case people are not familiar with that. But um, yeah, maybe, you can, maybe you can share the slide again. Okay. Yeah, maybe a good idea. On the more technical side, um, here we are. Okay, so the, the, the general point was is the shape of the space, i.e., what's called the topology, has an important um, 
as is, uh, in the way that the, uh, uh, the way you get generalization. So, in other words, from a psychological perspective, you can think of this as a kind of uh, compositionality or lack of compositionality, depending on. So, for example, <clears throat> a topological space. Okay, so you take any set. Say, for example, this set of three uh, three elements A, B, and C. Now, <clears throat> the topology is just a, a collection of the subsets of this. Now, there are different ways of splitting up the uh, different, different ways of collecting the uh, topology. For example, if you take every uh, subset, then you have what's called the discrete topology, and that's this example here. So A, A, B, and C are what's called the points of the space, and the topology is the way you organise these points into subsets, and they're called the open sets. Now, it's the intersection between these open sets that gives you some uh, sense of, of sort of shared information, I suppose. Now, the sheaf itself is actually the data actually sits on top of this, so. So hence the distinction between the, the underlying space and the data that sits on top of it. Now in the, uh, so the left, this one here is what's called an indiscrete space where there's just uh, just the empty set and the the, thing, the set itself. So there's no sense of um, a, a constituent structure that, that as far as from a topological perspective, all these three points are the same. On the right hand side, this is, um, the, uh, B itself is the only isolated point, but <clears throat> A and B and B and C are on their own, but it's not a discrete topology because we don't have the AC connection here. So what that means in terms of, for example, uh, colour binding, uh, for example, what you get in a sort of visual search task, <coughs> is that um, when you do the, the sheaving, you think of this as, if, you, if you're familiar with uh, relational databases, you can think of this as a what's called a join. And what's happening is... Um, in suppose you when you sort of perceive say the the idea is when you perceive say um, this uh, oblique uh, red uh, rectangle there's a color feature there's a, uh, um, a orientation feature and there's also a, a spatial feature as well uh, these <clears throat> these features get um, sort of bound together sort of there's a like, you can think of this as like a color map and on this side you can think of this as a um, shape map and then, but because of the way of the, uh, because of the shape of, of the uh, underlying space, uh, these two get bound together by their common location, because it's called the join. So you join this table and you join this table and you get this type of table. And you only join because on the, on the common location. Now, if you were to use a, a discrete space instead of where the color and shape are also uh, open sets, then you get a completely different result. In fact, you get all possibilities, which is not what you want in, in visual search. So... I think this is related to um, the, the notion of, uh, in Matteo's slide, which showed the uh, grid had all these um, uh, interunit connections. And in this sense, <coughs> whereas the map didn't, so in the map case, you might think of these as a discrete space, with, uh, sorry, an indiscrete space where there is no overlap between the, the points. Uh, this is just and so on and so on. So, yeah, I think there is a, definitely a, a connection there. But, uh, and so just to sum up the point of it, the point is that the by making shape, a, a sort of ex, by explicitly modeling shape, then you have processes that can operate, that can change the structure of that shape. And then sheet theory has a whole bunch of techniques for, for working with, with these ideas that I didn't go into. But, yeah. yeah, so the, the, this slide is actually good. Um, I was thinking that uh, just briefly, uh, this T two situation, discrete, all subsets of yes, X. Yes, that's right. That's so discrete space just means the yeah. essentially just the power set. Every every possible subset of the of the base set X is a open set. Mm. And that that's pretty much uh, what IAT would kind of you know predict that you know, it would relate to the phenomenology of the space based on the map versus yes. the kind of analysis, right? Yeah, so in the 2019 paper by Andrew Hohn and Giulio Tononi, the space, space, so-called space paper, uh, this is one of the examples is that in order to perceive space, basically the hypothesis is that the mechanisms have to basically specify a, a causal topology. <laughs> so they have to have mechanisms that specify each of these subsets that in this case would define the power set of all the possible groupings. And only in this case you can find all the locations, all the spots, all the possible, um, basically, groupings of, of the space. In this case, yeah, T2 would be the complete one, whereas, like, if you just had 
a topology like T1 that couldn't possibly correspond to your phenomenology of space because you wouldn't be able to basically isolate A, B, or C or pairs of A, B, and B, C. So you need mechanisms that causally uh, specify uh, causes and effects over all the subsets. And in this case, this would be the phenomena, the, sorry, the causal distinctions in the cause of extraction. Mm. And the topology would, would, would derive, would basically come out of the relations between these causal distinctions. So this is incredibly interesting, I, I agree. Yeah, and maybe different kind of aquaria, like, you know, your face or object would be possibly like T3, where some kind of location is bound to a particular type of feature, but a feature and the feature may not be necessarily related or something like that, potentially. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I took a lo lot of time. Uh, Beth? Um, yeah, I have a question for Steve, um, and it's not about consciousness, it's about, um, I have a background in reasoning, so I was wondering if you can, if you could think of like the one point space of when we reason heuristically, and when we do this, the trade-off is it may not be as accurate, but it is easier, easier for us for, to process, and then when we have the two point space, this is when we apply, you know, more accurate models. And in more complex situations, this is better for us to do. Could you think about it that way? Yeah, that's pretty much spot on. <laughs> so, um, if we go back to the. Uh, yeah, basically that. Yeah, exactly. That, that's that, that's the way to think about it. Is that the. Um, in the one point space, the, the data is the same, but there is there is no um, uh, there is no um, consideration for its possible constituents. So yeah, um, where reasoning uh, requires. Uh, but um, taking apart the uh, the stimuli into its components. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I want to talk about something else, like in um, uh, trains of inference is an example of this. But uh, it, it, it'll take me a while to explain it. But yeah, I, I just want to say yes. I, I think I agree with what you said, uh, and probably what. If you're familiar with the, I think it's Evans and Stanovich's notion of type one versus type two cognition, you can think of the one point space as being um, a type one where it's sort of associative, there is no components, it's just holistic processing. Where type two is more symbolic in the sense that there is a notion of composition, that's comp which is over this side, sorry, which is the notion of compositionality. Uh, that the, the components are placed together in a particular way and then you you manipulate the components to get the generalization. So uh, it's, it's not obvious, I suppose, that why space should be this way, but from a topological perspective, probably what's missing here is, is I didn't give you the, uh, uh, the, the notion, of, the, the more formal notion of why, uh, what is a pre-sheaf or a sheaf and how, how the compositionality relates here. The, the idea is that in a topological space, it consists of, what's called uh, the open sets and the inclusion relations. So for example, in a very simple case that I gave, it's a two point space, but there is an uh, open set. For example, the right dimension is included in the open set of left and right dimension. And it's this inclusion relationship that gives you, that indicates the, the structure of the space. And then <clears throat> what the sheaf is doing is it's what's called a functor and it's mapping that into the data. And the data goes in the opposite, and the, the, the structural relation goes in the opposite direction. This is called the restriction. So the data here, Ka, for example, um, <clears throat> uh, when you go in the opposite direction, what you're doing is actually restricting it to a particular component. Here is the A, or the E is getting re restricted here. This is called a, normally when you think of compositionality, the, the arrows go in the same direction. But in the, and for sheath theory, the arrows go in the opposite direction. Hence, it's called a contravariant functor. And so it's this compositional structure. So the point about reasoning is that, or, or, or simple processing, is that you have to have some sort of notion of compositionality. But even space has a notion of compositionality, particularly in, in 
topology via the, the, the inclusion relationships between the, the, the parts of the space. So, yeah, to sum up, yes, I agree with your intu intuition versus re re reasoning uh, distinction. Thank you. Other questions? Not, uh, I had a more of a curiosity uh, for Matteo. Uh, when you when you talk uh, talked about the distinction between subjectivity and objectivity and function uh, and phenomenology, you use the word uh, accompany, like uh, phenomenology, consciousness, company as a function, and so on. So to play devil's advocate, one could say. Look, but uh, uh, if you say that phenomenology or better, that two systems can be functionally equivalent, can do the same thing, input output functions are the same. But uh, in us, like in system like us, yeah, there is phenomenology that just companies, right? Uh, these functions. It means that phenomenology itself doesn't do really anything, right? Just there, it pops up, but it doesn't do anything. And is this what uh, IIT entails, a sort of epiphenomenalism, something like that? Thank you. Uh, this is, of course, a, a traditional question <laughs> and a good one. Um, I, I have to admit my, my, my guilt in using the term accompany, and actually it's, it's on purpose. It's the term that I think is as neutral as possible. <laughs> I don't want to say, you know, just saying when there are some functions that are performed, usually there is some phenomenology that is also happening. <laughs> and most of the time, when there is some phenomenology happening, there are some functions that are performed. So this is completely, you know, from a metaphysical perspective, neutral in the sense that we don't say that they, they co-occur in the sense that one implies the other or that they are identical. Um, so in this case, I was re literally trying to be as neutral as possible. But for IIT, uh, there is actually a very, very specific explanation um, of the metaphysical relationship between the two, which is uh, this famous central identity of IIT. So the idea in principle is not that uh, phenomenology simply accompanies functions as this sort of extra ingredient that is just this coating of paint that doesn't really do anything causally. But it, it's uh, the opposite, so to speak. There is this identity between the causal powers of a system and phenomenology. Now, identity is a tricky word, of course, because there's many, many, many meanings. Um, most of the time, identity is used as a uh, basically tool for reduction. We can say that water is identical to H2O to say that we're reducing water to H2O or that temperature is identical to mean kinetic energy. And we can say we're reducing um, temperature to mean kinetic energy. But we are not saying in this case that consciousness is identical to cause effect power and therefore can be reduced to cause effect power. Because in IIT, consciousness is, of course, the starting point and it's more fundamental. The idea is that cause effect power is postulated from within experience to explain experience. So in a sense, it's an explanatory identity a la, a la Levin. We are basically saying experience has the properties it has and it's real. It's probably the most real thing we can conceive of. In order to explain what it is, we come up with this uh, basically set of physical notions that are cause effect power, operation, etc., to explain the properties of phenomenology. But by no means we are saying that we can reduce one to the other. My humble opinion, which is, of course, not IIT's maybe um, official uh, um, uh, sort of position, is that you, you can take a sort of, uh, you can take the stance in which experience and cost effect power are really two sides of the same coin. You have two ways to describe the same phenomenon. There is only one numerically identical, you know, object <laughs> that is your experience. From within, you can describe it phenomenologically. From without, you can describe it in terms of cause effect power. But that's to me, when I say a company, of course, in that case, I'm trying to be neutral, but there is definitely an identity um, variety. I hope this answers the question. <laughs> yeah, 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 thanks. That's super useful. Yeah. Thank you. Other, other questions? <laughs> 
Marcus says that he can uh, uh, ask a random questions. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I have a question as well, but I, I'm cognizant of the fact that we're seven minutes past our um, official endpoint, and I've already asked a couple of questions. So um, I'll let others go first. I just want to say that even after the the, the meeting ends, uh, if anybody wants to reach out by email, uh, you you know where to find me. I'm always happy to talk more and answer questions. So this is not the last chance. <laughs> But if no one else is keen, uh, I guess, Matteo, I'd be curious as to um, how you would respond to the objections of people like Eric Hull and Johannes Kleiner about falsification and consciousness and whether uh, what you're suggesting essentially deals with the criticisms they have um, in their work um, in that uh, their claim would be that um, either... Um, uh, how do I, sorry, I'm, uh, I, I'll, are you, maybe I'll make it two part. Are you aware of the sort of objections that they might have to the, what you're describing and yes, um, you have a response? Sorry. Sure. So, um, I think, um, it would be very long to go into the details of course of the objection and we would have to summarize it and then answer yeah. properly. <clears throat> but I think, um, so in my mind, my, my feeling is that the, those kind of objections are based on um, the attempt to apply the same epistemic standards of uh, explanations in science to consciousness, which is, I think, admittedly a, a fringe case. <laughs> so I do agree that an explanation of consciousness would look very different from explanations of other scientific phenomena to the point that it might even look like it's unfalsifiable, it's unscientific or pre-scientific or pre-falsified, whatever you want to you want to call it. Um, although I do believe that in the case of consciousness, the case of consciousness calls for uh, different, uh, basically explanatory uh, criteria, and I do believe that there is also a difference between. Um, the validation stage of a theory of consciousness, the testing, and also the fact that a theory of consciousness can make predictions or extrapolations. Most of the time, criticisms to IIT in particular, but also any other theory, causal structure theory, often they are clumped together, is that uh, we need independent reasons to believe that the predictions are correct. The problem is that I think this is a general issue in the consciousness science, that we have no independent reason to basically prove that our predictions of conscience are correct, precisely because the only way in which we can test the theory is on the cases where uh, we sort of set the gold standard of what uh, consciousness is. So healthy uh, human beings that can report um, and that are awake. Um, so everything else to me is really an extrapolation from the theory. And this doesn't mean that the theory cannot be tested. I think the theory can be falsified. But at the same time, uh, maybe the epistemic standards of scientific practice have to be at least amended in uh, in the case of consciousness. And I know also Nicolò have very interesting thoughts on this that I read in his papers and other people have talked about this, but yeah, that, this would be my general uh, reply. Great, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, in, in relation to that, uh, that actually also reminded me of uh, what Steve wrote in one of his papers, actually, that... Um, uh, I also wrote it uh, in a short blog on this issue. Um, you know, as, as you pointed out, normally uh, what is what's called theory in consciousness research has been kind of you know constructed out of the observation, which it aims to explain, right? Like you know, you do uh, experiments, or you collect lots of experiments, and then you try to make a model to explain that thing. And uh, because of that, uh, it's very similar to sort of Ptolemaiotic kind of, you know, situation of the science, of the cosmology, where you try to come up with something to explain, you know, what you observed. But um, unless you have a sort of independent data, as you said right now, or unless you have an uh, alternative or a, a theoretical new framework, which is independently developed, of this, you know, uh, link between the theory and phenomenology or theory and you know, observable, you cannot test it. 
especially for those that are, you know, uh, to test generalization cases. And in that sense, you know, I, I feel like um, IIT is on, on its own a bit weak because, you know, uh, it started with uh, mostly like Giulio's, you know, phenomenology and his uh, analysis case. But uh, uh, there are the, the two kind of things that I'm kind of, you know, recently interested in is the uh, case of the quantum uh, uh, cognition and another one is the category theory. Both of them are completely independently developed. But the case of some psychophysical situation, such as similarity rating of the phenomenology of the two cases, these kind of things can be tested or can be explained by this you know, completely different you know, independent mathematical kind of you know, structure. And that may be, the, you know, I don't know whether quantum cognition or category theory itself is directly you know, explainable better than IIT, but as a sort of that, framework change you know something to uh, uh something that has been developed for something else to explain or predict or you know extrapolate consciousness is probably something that we need next yeah that was my comment There is something called the unificatory power in philosophy of science. It's one of the pragmatic virtues of uh, uh, scientific theories. Yeah, people use it sometimes, and that that I guess that comment points to that. The fact that uh, if you manage to like sort of unify like a theory with other independent established frameworks, might be like a pragmatic virtues. Mm -hmm. Then the question is whether pragmatic virtues are epistemic virtues. So if they speak to the truth or not of a theory, but that's not a question. Mm. Um, questions, comments? Oh, well, maybe just one last comment. Yeah, I 100% I agree. I, I honestly, I, I don't believe, I, this is actually something that came up recently in a um, with the Merker uh, behavioral brain sciences paper and commentaries. I don't believe, and I don't think anybody should think that IIT is claiming to be uh, a complete and correct <laughs> explanation of conscience at this stage. It's very tentative and very exploratory. I think the, the, um, the virtue, although is as like now you are saying it's, um, it's trying to move some steps in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It is probably incomplete and it probably cannot do the whole thing on its own unless it will be developed further. So I totally agree with you that there are probably a lot of bits and pieces that are missing. Um, but I think realizing, for instance, uh, that consciousness is just a different kind of phenomenon, like it, that requires a different set of epi epistemic and explanatory standards could be an important um, thing. And usually other theories, like I also tried to say in my talk, other theories, even just when we try to sort of almost simplify and talk about objective and subjective properties and the approach that theories have usually in neuroscience, they try to apply the usual Galilean paradigm. Um, I think IIT is a little bit of an outsider in this, which is, I think, a virtue, at least uh, for, yeah, as a, as a pioneering way to try to find a different direction. But this doesn't mean, of course, that it, it's neither right nor, nor the only one that can succeed. So. I agree. Uh, Marco? Yeah, thanks. I, I think I do have at least one more burning question. Um, so so um, this is to both speakers. I'm kind of curious um, to what extent I think I might be able to deal with this. So um, some of you may know the brain is uh, to some extent notably realized, or at least the representations of the phenomena are. Um, so if one would entertain the possibility of phenomenology or the cause of structure uh, to be uh, fundamentally expressible in these category theoretical diagrams, would it be possible to imagine that then these diagrams, to, for shorthand, can basically be moving about with respect to their physical uh, substrate? So in other words, um, is it plausible that IIT would have a difficulty um, extracting these causative structures or these diagrams or sheaf-like relations um, even if they're constantly moving about with respect to their physical substrate. Does that make sense, Matteo? Uh, what do you mean by moving moving about, just, just to understand? 
So, for example, imagine you have uh, some neural population um, that is responsible for the representation of, I don't know, square or, uh, or color. And imagine then multiple combinations of the individual neurons and the connections and the weights are uh, able to realize a particular phenomenology. Same by virtue of the fact that they then realize the same cost and effective structure with the same kind of sheaf theoretic relations. Um, so then you would have a non strict relation between the physical particularities um, and the abstract relations to keep it shorthand. Um, would something like PyFi or the way the IIT goes about this still be able to extract these kind of um, structures? Well, so definitely not at the, at the moment. <laughs> and uh, okay. I don't even know in principle because uh, there are clear computational limitations. And even if we consider using the entire universe <laughs> as, as our exactly. computer, it's probably going to be very tough. And in a sense, this okay. also tells us something about the fact that existence uh, cannot be really be computed. It just is the set of constant powers is there. Um, uh, but that, that's a separate thing. Uh, on on the the explanatory side, though, I don't think this is necessarily a limit because we know or we have reason to think that we have enough, you know, technological capabilities to at least monitor the state of the brain at the right grain, at the right both spatial and temporal grain that is important for consciousness. So, for instance, when we do again some sort of decoding, or when we do multivariate, uh, you know, analysis and these kind of things, we are. Um, already able to, by relying on previous knowledge of what states of the brain that have been, you know, observed and, and of course, networks that have been trained, we're able to predict what uh, the experience is going to be like the usual uh, predicting what you're dreaming, etc. Or the movie you're watching. So I think we could do something like that with IIT. We could, in principle, uh, really compute some... Um, and find some heuristics to pre-compute the uh, um, the cause effect structure based on some uh, common patterns or frequent patterns of activation of frequent and, and and macro areas, and then we could basically try to use these heuristics to generalize and say whenever we observe this kind of pattern that we know is going mm -hmm. to do some sort of cause effect structure that is related to pain or that is related to the experience of color. So. I have absolutely no idea to what extent this can meet, be made precise and uh, technologically what are the advancements that are going to be needed. But of course, the hope is that um, uh, showing that an explanation of this sort could in principle lead there is already a very important big step uh, because the connection between the states of the brain and phenomenology, I think, is really the missing link. Then it becomes sort of like an empirical question and, and there is a there's a chance that it will just be impossible in practice, but I think the the practicalities are, are in in general usually less less interesting and less problematic. So so that that's my hope. But yeah, the conceptual side is the one that I think we, we, we can and should focus on for now. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank oh, yeah. Matteo. Sure. Uh, I I uh, as a sort of I'm hosting this uh, YouTube, but I I have to leave now. So uh, I'll just you know end the stream and then I'll just leave. But you guys can now uh, continue. And I just wanted to thank you before I finish this you know uh, streaming. Um, uh, you know, bo uh, all all of you like attendees and Matteo and uh, Nicolo and uh, Steve especially. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll just stop uh, streaming right now. All right. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. All right, and uh, I'll have to 